We're live. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Kenny, uh, Kenny's uh, Cars and Coffee. I think we are looking for a little bit of a new name. It's, ca it's Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown in tribute. Oh, no, in spirit. In spirit. Yeah, yeah. in spirit. So, yeah, Kenny's but, here with us in spirit. But Brad actually had another name for it. What was your the name that you wanted? Well, I wanted to call it Bullcrap and Bagels. But apparently that, that got out the boss lady didn't yeah. like that. So. No, no, so it's not going to be that. But anyway, welcome to uh, Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown and Spirit. We are happy to be here. We have wonderful guests today. And this um, is episode 81. 81? Don't forget, 81. 81. Yep. And we want to thank everyone for joining us. And so we have uh, exciting people here, uh, special guests. And many of you know them. Uh, they've been in the media for a long, long time. We want me to stand that up. So anyway, uh, so we have Jim Camposano, also known as Campy, and we have Revan Evan Smith with us today. So we're going to uh, bring them on fairly shortly. Uh, just wanted to announce that uh, we will be doing continuing with Cars and Coffee. We mentioned that last week. If you were not able to watch the Kenny Brown tribute last week, uh, feel free to look that up. Is it on? You can go to our YouTube channel. And um, the Kenny Brown tribute video in its in full length is 45 minutes long, roughly, is is up for everyone to see. And we were gonna we're gonna try to um, also put the uh, Cars and Copy or Cars and Coffee episode 80, which was last weekend, um, which has the video and then um, the before and after. So once I get back to Indiana or back to Florida, I will load that up on YouTube so everybody can see the comments and everything else. Yeah, and what was really interesting about that, we've got many comments on the uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live that we did last week, the memorial. Uh, it goes into great detail. People were memorializing them, and we were reading, and, and we were communicating back and forth, and it's just very lovely. So if you'd like to watch that, uh, I'd highly recommend it. But anyway, now let's get to our Oh, study. wait, we have one thing. What? So um, <laughs> somebody suggested that we do, um, when we start the episodes, that we do a what's in Kenny's toolbox. So Ooh. I've been rummaging through his toolbox. I can't figure out how to get all of his drawers open. But I found this one cool thing I want to show you. So this right here, hopefully everybody can see it. Everybody knows that Kenny used to run the Skip Barber program at Road America. And so in his toolbox, I found the key to the front great gate at Road America, which he's had in his toolbox forever. So this is probably, I don't know, this is from the 1980s or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to get in the front gate after hours at Road America, I got the key now. <laughs> he used to take his Porsche and uh, he'd close everything up and then he'd just drive around Road America. So that's one of his favorite tracks. He spent a lot of time there. Well, let's get on. We have, again, very interesting guests, uh, uh, Evan. Revan Evan Smith and Jim Campy Campasano. So let's join in. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Hey, guys. Yeah. What's happening? Good to see you. And uh, we invited Jim and uh, Evan here because we they uh, have a lot of experience with uh, Kenny Brown uh, working with them and a lot of memories. So we thought it would be uh, a good idea to invite them and they could share some of their memories. So uh, just Jim, real quick, can you give us a little background on you in case people don't know who you are? I think everybody well, does. I, you know, I my my real background. I I was a kid who grew up loving cars and loved reading about cars. And um, according to my mom, I spent too much time reading car magazines. So I got the ultimate revenge. My my first job in the automotive industry was being copy editor, where I actually got paid to read about cars. So that that uh, got me off the hook with my mother. Um, I was editor of Muscle Mustangs. Um, from 93 to 2006 and that's when I met Ken for the first time I think you guys you guys were still in uh, was it Nebraska or you know project industries back then um, you hadn't moved to India yet um, and like I said Kenny uh, I, although I'm sure I scared him quite a few times in a car um, he was just a great influence on me He's such a cool guy um, one thing we had in common was coffee, his love of coffee. Um, we used to spend so much time just talking. I know he had he had Ken's Blend in Indy, uh, the one coffee shop. So um, it's, uh, it's very tough for me because I, I thought he was the best. But um, I'm really happy to be here today to carry on spirit. 
Thank you, Jim. That, that was beautiful. Um, Evan, why don't you give us a quick background on you and uh, then if you want to share a memory and then we'll just start sharing some really fun stories about Kenny. Sure. <clears throat> so much like Jim, I grew up uh, with an insane love for cars with really no explanation why I had that attraction. There's multiple pictures of me as a baby and a little kid with just a, every picture as a car, I have a car in my hand and that grew and grew. Uh, I ended up working on cars, being a dealership mechanic, realizing that that was not the best path for me. And I uh, went back to school. And at the time I was very fortunate that I lived uh, only about 15 minutes from English town raceway park. So drag racing was very accessible to me. And that's actually where I met Jim Camposano and the guys who were doing Cars Illustrated and Muscle Mustangs. And once I got my five liter Mustang and started racing it, um, I was always into photography. So I ended up doing some photography for Steve Collison, the uh, editor before Jim at Muscle Mustangs. And then when I finished school, Jim, um, <clears throat> Jim hired me full time. And that became a 20 year ride uh, through the um, ups and downs of the Mustang industry. And it, you know, it gave me access to people like Kenny and yourself and Brad. And even though my roots were kind of in drag racing, uh, Jim got me to go to a uh, Kenny Brown track time school where I thought I was going to be an instant hero and quickly realized that I know nothing about turning left or turning right or stopping the car other than, you know, how much room is in the shutdown area. And over time, uh, just the relationship with Kenny grew. We just we clicked, he and I. Much like uh, Jim and Kenny clicked, he was such an easy guy to be around, a uh, fantastic coach, um, just always had words of wisdom, whether it was on or off the racetrack. And, you know, just like any friendship that you have over time, it grows and grows and never stops growing. And, you know, just ultimately uh, became great friends and we've all stayed in touch, which has been fantastic. So, Evan, I've got a question for you. Why don't you give us a, a good, cool story about the first time you and uh, you and Kenny ever went on track together? I think you were driving the red rocket, maybe? Um, I was. Blue. So, right. So I, I rode, I think, for a couple laps with somebody at Putnam Park. Jim could probably remember the year. I don't remember the year, but it had to be somewhere around like 97 or 98 because it was in his red rocket. It was either like a, you know, uh, SN95 supercharged. Um, Cobra. Uh, yep. And uh, it was what was the designation of that car? It was like a KB4 or I forget the exact designation, but I have a picture. I found a picture of myself with that car um, recently. Anyhow, so my very the first. The Red Rocket. Pack, they called it the Red Rocket. The Red Rocket. I thought there was a name for the suspension package. And uh, so we go on track and it's it had just rained. So the track is not soaking wet, but it's wet enough. And I was flat out terrified. I'm not going to lie. And uh, I kind of followed Kenny's instructions. The first one being always check your brakes on the uh, track exit. Make sure that they're there before you get to the first corner. And I still do that today. And force of habit, I even do that in iRacing. I just step on the brake pedal. And we started marching around on track. And uh, I think I instantly scared Kenny because fortunately or unfortunately, I think I had a natural ability to have some car control. And of course, like everybody else, I wanted to step on the loud pedal. So, you know, I was going faster than I should for my skill level at the time. But I made it through the session. I learned a lot. We pulled in and Kenny looked over at me. Uh, I mean, just as serious as can be. And he goes, you are scary fast. And I don't mean that in a good way. He said, you're fast. Well, thank God you have some decent car control. But I think we can make you into a good driver. And ever since that day, uh, you know, I've driven probably 10 or 15 to Kenny's cars. I've been able to race in a couple of competitions on track and feel safe about it. And Kenny's, you know, helped me, you know, learn as a driver. Um, but, yeah, I think – I don't think he was really scared, scared. But I think, you know, he wanted to kind of put the fear into me. So it was kind of cool. Oh, Actually, I've, I've been in a car with you, Evan. I'm sure he was scared, scared. <laughs> yes. Yes, Evan, he was scared, scared. He uh, comments, he goes, that was scary. He goes, if Evan can get his 
what I can't remember what he said, his mind or whatever together, he's going to be a really fast driver. But right now he is scary fast. So, I, he, he really knew nothing, I knew nothing about, you know, how to, yeah. how to apply the brake pressure, how to manipulate the sprung weight of the vehicle, um, you know, how to keep the, the contact patch in the best position. I just knew that I had, you know, I could control the car if it started sliding. I was naturally going to correct um, entering turns way too fast, understeering, snap over steering. And then if, you, if, if anybody's ever been to Putnam Park, so I think that what really got him was we dive into the carousel down there. And if you, it's a turn, if you're not familiar with Putnam Park, that kind of dives down and then it's a big sweeping carousel and comes up on the other side. And we went in a little too hot. I snap over steered. And I just held the throttle on pretty much the whole way. And I drifted before drifting was a thing all the way through the turn. And now we're carrying a lot of speed coming up the hill and you have to be over to the left. And somehow I made the next corner and I, I think he was probably just shaking his head. Like, what is this idiot doing? <laughs> yeah, I think it was car control. He goes, he goes if, if he can capture like car, car control and just a little more experience, he's going to be really fast. But right now he's scary. So so, Jim, Jim, why don't you give us a little story about your first time on track with Kenny? I don't know if that was at Putnam Park or if it was at Watkins Glen. I believe it was at actually Watkins Glen. I, we did. I, it's funny that I had been to I had been to the Putnam once or twice. Actually, no, I hadn't been. I hadn't been there before. But the first time at Watkins Glen, now I had known, you know, obviously Kenny Brown performance was a big advertiser of Muscle Mustangs. I had been to one driving school uh, when I was editor of Muscle Cars Magazine back in the day when I had a, uh, a C4 Corvette. So, you know, I had one driving school under my belt. So I was, of course, Mario Andretti Jr. here. And um, so we were at Watkins Glen in my 97 Cobra. And again, you really don't know how much you don't know until you're in a car behind the wheel and especially on a track like Watkins Glen, which to this day is still my favorite track, but what a, what a amazing experience. So we're going around. And of course, like most novices, I had the tires set at 35 PSI because that's what it said. Max pressure 35. So, you know, some is good. 35 is better. And we, we were about half a lap in. And if the car felt awful, I mean, it had, you know, the car had been lowered. It had um, had your control arms in it, um, and but it just felt like I was driving on oil tires. The car was sliding all over the place. Penny was like, "Go back into the pits before we even, you know, instead of going around for the first, we go back in." And this is where Brad, you you pop up, and it was like, "Take take the tire temperatures," and he took the tire temps. Told them exactly, put 28 pounds in the front, 30 in the rear. We go back out on track, and now all of a sudden, the car is stuck to the track. And I was like, wow, well, that was easy. Um, you know, they were just just street tires. It was, it was not a, a, a road race, street road race tire. It was just a, a basic, probably a Nitto tri triple five at the time. And but all of a sudden, the car really felt like something. And that was the first major lesson I learned about car control on track from Kenny was make sure your tire pressures are right. And that was such a, I could picture those sheets in my mind. You probably have a, a pad of them still. Every car at our driving schools, that was the Muscle Mustang Kenny Brown school we put on together. And I just took that so much away from tire, tire pressures. And I've kind of gone with people when I was at, other magazines and Super Chevy and driving their cars on track and it would have so much air in the tires. It was like, no, you got to take them out. Let the car, let the tire do the work. And that was lesson one from Kenny. Yeah. yeah, cool. That's a cool story. And I think that your car, that wasn't that the one of the Muscle Mustang feature cars that you uh, had nicknamed Superfly? Superfly, D-O-H-C, dual overhead cam, but as we called it, Destroyer of hideous Camaros. <laughs> That's I, will tell you, Jim, the, I think, uh, Jim, I think you're the only guy to ever tackle um, Watkins Glen with either 456 or 488 gears. 488s, please. Wow. 
What's a 456? That's a baby gear. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and I, I remember, Evan, you being at Watkins Glen, too. I think you were brave enough to try to follow me around the racetrack in all blue at one point. And um, that probably gave you a, a good taste of just how crazy I am behind the wheel. Yeah, I, I, I rode with you a couple times, and uh, thankfully I'm still here to talk about it. I think I followed you or rode with you at um, Sebring as well. The blue, the blue car, driving old blue was the first time for me that I ever drove a real race car. So, you know, Kenny had given me a lot of opportunities. I drove the red car, um, the red rocket, and I think a few other of Kenny's builds. And then he felt I was ready for the race car. And I always wondered why the, the, uh, why he held back on that because the other cars were much faster in a straight line anyway. And, uh, there is a huge difference if you've never done so between driving a street, a high performance street car still with sound editing and street brakes and street steering and street tires. Even if, even if the stuff is really good and grippy and powerful and durable, a race car has a totally different dynamic. It makes noises that would scare the crap out of somebody for the first time because the car, the brakes are screaming and talking to you. Um, you know, you hear, there's no sound deadening. So you hear every vibration, you feel everything. You're in a, you know, a seat that's um, bolted to the chassis of the car and with, with really very little padding. So you're feeling things that you wouldn't normally feel. And then of course that car had no ABS. So finding the limit and being able to go fast without just stepping on the brake really hard um, is a whole different experience. And I'm not saying I was really great at it, <clears throat> but I did recognize the differences. And when I finally got to drive that car, it was pretty special. What, what, what about you, Jim? Do you have any uh, fond memories of driving old blue, especially for the first time? You know, I just remember getting in it and just – you know, it's it's almost like your first kiss, your first date. I mean, it was, you know, you never forget your first race car, right? And I remember just, you know, driving that car at Watkins Glen, and my God, what a revelation! You know, and you know, again, coming from the more horsepower is always better school. I can never understand why Kenny never really amped up the power in that car. It was a very very light car. Um, it made like what right about 300 horsepower maybe yep. and you know but then when you get behind the wheel and you're driving it on track it was perfectly balanced um or as perfectly balanced as any car could be with me behind the wheel and um i just god i just remember so vividly the feeling the sound as evan said the sounds are incredible um you know just everything about it was was just blissful it was the only way i can describe it and uh god i put a lot of laps on that car at the different driving schools over the years different tracks putnam park um you know it's it really um it, it's a special car um and spying out to the max i mean just oh so great i mean you couldn't turn a tire bad in that car um the only time i ever had a, a weird experience in that car was when we, uh, Carrie, when you bought the car back for Kenny and Evan and I were going to shake it out on track before you got there. And the track at Putnam Park was wet. It was cold and forget slippery. And the tires on the car were really, really old and hard. And I'm riding shotgun and we're going around the track, Evan. What would you say about 30 miles an hour? And you turn the wheel and the car just goes straight. And I mean, it was like, there was, it wasn't anything wrong with the car or it was just the conditions. I mean, we weren't going fast, but it was just, you know, that was fun. But presenting the car to Ken at uh, the 25th anniversary was really, really special. Yeah, I know. I, rem I remember um, that, that morning fondly um, because um, we had it all set up so that, that you and and uh, myself and Evan would all be at the track uh, in the morning on Friday, um, well before Kenny and Carrie got there, um, because we wanted to kind of shake the car down a little bit because we had just gotten it back. 
And um, we didn't want Kenny to know anything about it. So we had sworn everybody that day to, to secrecy. And there was some debate, I think, about who was going to take the car out on the racetrack first, which it wasn't going to be me. And um, if we would have hit, would have had to draw straws, we totally would have rigged it so that Evan would have gotten the short straw and that he would have <laughs> he would have been the one to do it. But for, for whatever reason, we managed to convince Evan um, to take the car out and, and shake it down. And mind you that we only had slick tires for the car. So we had borrowed or we had gotten a set of Continental slicks from what was at that time the Grand Am series. And we'd, we'd put those on the car. And um, I think we all figured that Evan was probably the only person that was actually brave enough to go out there and try to put a few laps on the car in, in really what was just rain. I mean, it had been raining all day, and I know that Evan had quite the experience. So, Evan, why don't you tell us about those first two laps in Old Blue on slick tires in the rain in a car that um, we really hadn't even seen for, what, two or three years, probably? Sure. Well, we get to the track early, like you said, and that means very early because, you know, you're very rarely going to beat Kenny to the track. So we arrive – and we're looking at the car, we're looking it up and down, and I can just feel the energy and the emotion. And uh, then Brad drops it on us that we're gonna, he wants to shake it down, which to this day, I, th I think it must've been a conspiracy because we could have simply just handed the keys over to Kenny and he could have taken it back to the shop and gone through the car, which I'm sure he did before he drove it anyway. I think you guys just wanted to see if I was dumb enough to, to uh, go out on track, but he being, me being me, I, you know, I, I get, and of course, I was riding shotgun as always. Whenever you do something stupid, it's usually me involved. <laughs> yeah. We use we, that on track, and like Brad said, slick tires that are on a cold morning in incredibly wet conditions, still raining. Um, I, I don't even know that I'd call it a couple of laps. I think we just drove around the track. There was a couple spots I might have attempted to breathe on the throttle. And it resulted in some instant uh, drifting. And we did have a little bit of fun. And thankfully, we didn't go off track or put a tire wrong. But we did get to hear that little five liter rev and just the feeling of, a feeling of being strapped in the car. And, you know, once again, to get back in. It's always cool to get back in a race car that you haven't driven or seen in a while. Um, it's probably a blessing that it was raining because it prevented me from doing anything stupid. If it was dry, we might have turned some hot, hot laps. So maybe the rain was a blessing that morning looking back. And uh, and then we, the way we worked it was, I think, if I remember correctly, we swapped seats. Jim drove it a little bit. Um, and then we kept Kenny um, occupied while Jim drove the car up. Jim, uh, can, um, Kenny was giving a speech, talking in, in the tent to all the attendees that day. And... Uh, you know, Campy drove up and his head snapped around as soon as he heard that engine. He knew. Yeah, he didn't even have to see the car. I remember him saying, he goes, as soon as I heard the car start, I knew that was old blue. And yeah. I, I pulled up in it and, you know, it was, you know, it was pretty special moment. The look on his face. And again, that that was to, to be for you guys to have me drive the car up to him. I was completely honored. Um, well, I think I think the most priceless moment um, out of all that is when you you got out of the car and you had the key and you had walked up to the podium where Ken was and you sat down next to him and you handed him the key to the car and said, here, the car belongs to you now. And I think that he probably just completely broke down at that moment. He was that was such a, a special, priceless moment for him is when you handed him the keys back to his his you know famous beloved race car yeah, yeah. and uh, just to give you guys a little perspective in case you're just joining us we're talking about old blue kenny's race car um it's a 93 fox body and is it 93 yeah 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 and uh evan and uh campy had a lot of driving experience with that when kenny got very ill and we closed the company for a few years um we ended up selling that car um, and Kenny was just lamenting selling it. So for the, his 25th anniversary, the Kenny Brown uh, anniversary, I purchased the car back, and Brad uh, was able to go and uh, 
acquire it. And then uh, it had really bad tires on it. So they got something a little better, but yeah. we, it was too late to get new tires. Yeah, so we, had, anyway. we had we had some old Continentals from the Grand Am series laying around. We had a few sets of those. So we, <clears throat> we tossed a set of those on it. And we actually did have somebody kind of go through the car and make sure all the nuts and bolts were were tight, but it was amazing. I, I hadn't seen that car since probably 1996, I guess. And this was somewhere around 2011, maybe, is when I was able to locate the car in Franklin, Indiana. Um, a kid that I went to high school with had actually ended up with the car and he kept it in, in pristine condition. He was very meticulous about it, even had their original front fenders on it. We, we had taken the wide body front fenders um, off of the car and, and we had put on, uh, we'd put some, some regular fenders on there because we were actually preparing the car um, for vintage racing because the, the car was eligible for, for vintage. And we had already, Kenny had already made the decision that Jim Camposano and Evan Smith were gonna be the people who drove that car in the vintage racing series and would campaign it um, for us. And, and it, I think Jim's name is still on the car, but that, that car has a lot of history. That car raced at the um, Grand Prix of Tulsa in the, um, I guess in, at that time it was, it was called, yeah, the Grand Prix of Des Moines, I guess. And it was, um, it was called the SCCA Wall Challenge Series at that time. And, and that car was actually driven by Rob Fellows, who is Ron Fellows, brother and and rob was a was a pretty darn good driver himself although he he never ended up having the same kind of career that his brother ron fellows had he was he was one heck of a shoe so so that car you know does have quite a bit of history and there's there's several other people who, who drove that car um as well i think um lynn st james maybe at one point had driven mm -hmm. that car i'm not sure but but Old Blue was a uh, was a, a great beast, and and so I my and I have an interesting question for both of you um, because you before you do that I want to okay. announce uh, if you guys want to ask Jim or Evan any questions please put them in the comments and they'll be answering those so please uh, ask your questions or put comments in there we'd love to hear what you want to ask them go ahead yeah so um, anyway I just w was was curious. Um, you know the, the the first time that both of you um so this is this is a question for both evan and campy um you know you had driven a lot of mustangs being editors and Mus muscle mustangs and, and fast forward and um you, you weren't drag racing centric um per se at that time still anyway but but i'm just wondering um you know the first time that i ever drove a, a mustang that had a full kenny brown suspension in it and all i can remember is going from my my 89 Fox body, which which had all complete stock suspension. So the first time that I ever drove a Kenny Brown prepared car with Kenny's um, full suspension, and and it was I was awestruck. Um, it was just unbelievable how he could just take um, a well engineered system, put it on a car, and completely transform it into something that I can only describe describe as Porsche like or Ferrari. Like, so, so, you know, what, what were your thoughts on, you know, just how he prepared the cars, how he engineered his suspensions? And, and of course, the first time you, you drove them, you know, what, what were your thoughts, you know, regardless of what car it was, the Red Rocket or, or anything uh, else? I'll jump in here. I will say, you know, Kenny's philosophy, really keep it simple. You know, there are a lot, I, I used to deal with a lot of the Mustang companies drive a lot of cars and they were, some of them were very fast on, and certainly they were fast on the street, fast on the track, but they were unlivable. I mean, you just couldn't, they were just rattle traps and he, they would re-engineer the entire car. And, and then you get in one of Kenny's cars and it had the simplest, most basic stuff, but they were always fast, always faster. They were great cars. I mean, the, the more some of these people would do so many crazy things to these cars that, like I said, yeah, maybe in an actual road race or something that would be a little faster. I don't know. But Kenny's cars utilized the basics. And, you know, Ford did a lot of engineering on the Mustang before they gave it to you. I don't know if people know this, but the front suspension on the Fox Mustang was designed by the same guy who did the front suspension on the original Ford GT in the 60s. So 
the car did have some good bones. I mean, we always talk about, you know, we laugh because the car was in production so long, but the car really did have some some great engineering and the fact that you could do so much with the car um, back that up. But any great parts that you guys make and, you know, you and it showed you didn't need to re-engineer the car from the ground up to make it fast. Well, actually, one of the, Kenny's uh, Keep It Simple was one of his uh, values, but also um, he considered himself a, a car builder. And what he would do is he would engineer the car to perform together. So you really didn't know what was, if you drove it, you just knew it was a fantastic car. But he really had the correct braking package, the correct suspension, the correct amount of horsepower um, in the car. And that's why they, you know, it performed together. He always said, I'm a car builder first. And what if I can't find the parts that I need, I engineer, in, engineer them to, um, I create the parts myself. So I, I yeah, think that, that was, was really fabulous because he understood the, the whole car. Yeah, that, so was one of right, the, that was one of the unique things about Kenny is, is because he was a car builder first. He built the car and then he took everything that he had put on the car and basically carved that out into the, the parts program so that whenever he sold you a part, he knew that that was a proven part that he had tested and it, it was certainly worthy of putting his name on it, and then and then obviously sending it out to the the masses. Evan, Evan, what did you think about the first time you drove on a car that had a Kenny Brown suspension? Well, the first thing is I didn't know cars could do that because I'd really only been exposed to drag racing, where you put slicks on the car, you loosen the front end up, you make it bite and go in a straight line. Not that that's an easy thing to do. There's certainly a lot of science, um, but once I started to gather the theory behind how a car handles and takes a corner and the balance between understeer, oversteer, manipulating the sprung weight to make the, the, the tires that are doing the work, um, how to get the most performance out of them by either braking or, you know, with the accelerator pedal. I was able to then grasp what Kenny was doing. And on top of that, because my daily driver was a Fox body Mustang with stock brakes, there was no taking a turn fast. It understeered, it plowed like a dump truck. The back was light. It could spin the tires um, at will. So to, I'm probably most impressed with blue because Ford obviously improved the handling of the cars as they went down the line up until, you know, we got to S550. The cars are pretty damn good in stock trim. But to take a Fox body Mustang, and there were so many people that Kenny sold parts to and different suspension setups that he engineered for those cars, to take a car that really was not designed um, to be a race, have race car like handling, of course, for the time for the mid 80s, they did handle better than most cars. And coming out of the 70s, the Fox bodies handled better than the heavy lumps that were in the 70s and early 80s. Um, but it certainly wasn't race car like handling. So for him to go into his own brain and figure out uh, the geometry, steering angles, caster and camber, and more impressively, what to do with the rear suspension, that to me was just absolutely incredible that uh, he was able to do that. Yeah, you know, Kevin, you spent, um, well, both of you spent a lot of time with Kenny on track, but but Evan, you you went on and um, and you've done some pretty some pretty cool things. You've uh, you're a, a one lap of America winner um, with your um, co-driver Jeff Lacina. I think you were driving a, a Roush RS3 or something like that at the time, and and you've driven several race cars. So can can you give us maybe some insight into what the things that you learned from Kenny? Um, early on that you were able to to carry on throughout the rest of your career and, and even get into to doing some real some real racing. What, what are a few things maybe that you carried over that you think really helped you um, transcend to, to, you know, to that next level? Uh, there's quite a lot, Brad uh, and Carrie, to be honest with you. The first thing is uh, there's literally like a checklist in my brain that's embedded when I do uh, on track or the times where I've been fortunate enough to drive a real race car in a, in a competition. Um, there's literally like a checklist that's emblazoned into my brain from it starts days before hydrating yourself, not, not staying up late, not drinking alcohol. Kenny was big on that. Not too much caffeine, drink a lot of water, uh, especially, you know, the day before. Um, 
And then simple things like Jim alluded to earlier, tire pressure. Make sure whether you're doing it or your crew is doing it, that it's done properly. Inspect the car because your life could be on the line when you get in that race car and you hit that first corner. So you want to make sure that the car is in good shape. And then build your speed up. Don't go out there and set a hot lap the third lap. You're going to, if you're at an open track event, especially where you're going to get five or six sessions, then start slow, build your speed, and, you know, work on your braking zones and you'll go faster that way. If you're driving a Mustang, I always remember Kenny's theory, which was break in a straight line. Don't trail brake too much. Um, turn in, open the wheel and go. You don't want to have a lot of steering angle in a big, heavy front engine Mustang when you go back to the throttle. So open that wheel up, breathe the power on, do everything smooth. Apply the brakes aggressive, but smooth. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, before you head out on track, you're going down the, um, the pit out. Just tap the brake. Make sure they're there. Make sure that there's nothing uh, that caused a brake failure that you're going to go barreling into the first corner. And then as the weekend progresses, maintain your hydration, make sure you eat. And then everybody thinks that you're going to just keep going faster. Say it's a Saturday, Sunday deal and you get six on track sessions. Your last session is not going to be your fastest session. It's going to be maybe the first session or the second session, the second day. And that last session, turn it back a notch because now you've got all the confidence in the world and you might get the red mist. Don't get the red mist. And if you don't know what that is, Brad will explain it. That that's really good, Evan. That you are uh, almost saying uh, word for word what Kenny preached to you. I can tell you you were a good student. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, red 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 mist was was always a, a term um, that Kenny used for for people that just completely forgot all the fundamentals, um, lost their mind, and um, and and he would he would always like when when we were doing track days, he would always coach everybody at the beginning, beginning, we're going to do tire pressures and tire temperatures for everybody. And, and his rule of thumb is when you pull onto pit lane and you stop where the crew is to get your tire pressures and temperatures taken, always take your wheel and turn it away from the pit wall. And there was a really valid reason why he did that because there were many of times when people would come in and they would turn their wheels to get their, their tire temperatures and their tire pressures taken. And they would have so much red mist and they would be so fogged up that they would forget where the front of the car is, is pointing. And they would let off the clutch and take off and drive straight into the pit wall. So that, that happened a couple of times. Um, and so that's that's a perfect example of just completely losing your mind when you have when you have red mist, because being on the racetrack is is a is a is a an experience you have the sights and the sounds and the smells and the adrenaline rush and and everything when you get all of that going at, at one time the brain starts to get just a little fogged and, and not work so another well. tip that we oh, used to uh, give people when they were driving on track because that you do have that adrenaline and you're not thinking straightly when you come into the pits to get your tire temperatures taken you always turn your wheel out away from the uh guardrail because if you, you you forget you'll run right into the drive uh guardrail and that so did that happen that, good. Yes. that did happen at some driving school yeah. so Brad, and one, one more thing on red mist just because it's funny <clears throat> and i'm sure you've seen it and uh jeff lacina and anybody who's been an instructor has seen it the the other red mist that kenny was also talking about was so you you're you're a, a maybe not a dead novice but you're a c or d class driver which is nothing wrong with that everybody's got to learn and you, you've gone through the first day, everything went well. Second day, second session, third session, you're feeling awesome. And that's when you go from uh, being a C or D class driver to thinking that you are Dan Gurney. <laughs> because everything feels so good and you have confidence now, you made it through the weekend, and that's when you find out you are not Dan Gurney. Yeah, I had a I have a great red miss story from, from one of our Kenny Brown schools at Watkins Glen. I mean, and, you know, no matter how much you preach it, and Kenny preached it all the time, and I was I was in my Cobra, um, and this was not our first school. I mean, we did a lot of schools at the Glen, so I'm really like, you know, like I said, between – I just think I'm the, the greatest driver ever. And, you know, they always – Kenny would always preach that last session, dial it back. And But I was going so fast, I thought I was truly the world's greatest driver. Um and that might be true, but in this instance, the red mist took over, 
and we're coming out of the boot at Watkins Glen. I mean, I'm hauling butt in my Cobra. Uh, and you know, Evan will tell you how much I love that car. I mean, a car was never dirty. Um, I mean, I waxed it like crazy, put like 9,000 coats of wax on the car and with my daily driver and I'm flying around Watkins Glen and we used to use the whole track, including the boot. We, we didn't do the shorter NASCAR track. And I'm coming up, making that left hand around the boot and now the car's gliding. And all I can see is this great wall of blue and white arm cup. And I'm thinking, what is the right side of my car gonna look like with blue and white stripes on it? At the last second, the car grabbed and I finished the session a lot slower than I did before, but red mist is a real thing. Um, and it almost proved very, very expensive, a very costly mistake. So that would have been the first time that you messed up your car or the, your car got messed up that I didn't do it. There you go. <laughs> you know, the one, two things that Kenny used to say, and this is a true story and I use it to this day. I mean, of course the first one was slow in, fast out, fast in, spin out. Those, and these are, they were probably tattooed on his arm somewhere, Carrie. You can let me know if they were or not. But my favorite, my absolute favorite, and I've, I use this all the time, and even a couple of times when I was trying to teach people how to drive on track, the tachometer is not an applause meter. Um, people will just get crazy. They, they think the tack is just there to cheer them on, and it's like, guess again. And, you know, I, I find it interesting that, like I said, I did enough schools with Kenny and then, you know, when Evan and I were like the senior members of the staff at one point, you know, we had been there forever. People would come to us, you know, when we we were one of the few small magazines. When I say magazines, meaning Super Chevy, Muscle Mustangs, our Mopar magazine, that we actually got made deals with racetracks that not only did we have the drag strip, but we could use the road course. So we kind of became the guys who would school some of the younger kids before they could go to real racing schools we give them some instruction which like i said given my skill level is a pretty remarkable thing that anybody would let me do that but um but thank any i mean i didn't say anything that kenny didn't say to me i could see what people were doing they scared me just like kenny, you know just like i scared kenny paybacks the paybacks are tough but let me tell you um the idea that I could do that was all because of Kenny. And the one thing we don't talk about just driving on track is how much safer a driver you become on, on the street. So many times his instructions have probably saved me from a major accident, how to brake properly, car control. You know, when we were in the Northeast, driving in the snow was no different than driving on track and vice versa. You know, when the car is doing unfortunate things, the car control lessons helped me pull it out. So, again, I'm just grateful uh, to have gotten that experience with Kenny and nothing else, just to, to really meet Brad and, and you, Carrie. I mean, just great stuff. Yeah, I can, I, can rem I can remember one muscle Mustang and fast forward um, editor um, who came out and did a school with us at Putnam Park and uh, apparently. Um, his boss, Jim uh, Camposano, forgot to um, clue him in on some of the basics before he, he got to the track. And I think he forgot to listen to Kenny um, as well. And um, that gentleman's name was Vincenzo Kong. And I think that he um, he earned a, a nickname after that. We, we called him Spinny Vinny because he did not grasp the concept of um, slow in fast out, fast in, spin out. And I think it was probably, I don't even know if he made it fast past the first turn at Putnam Park before he had the car completely backwards and, and in the grass. So I think he must have He perfected the term spinny Vinny. I mean, he... Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was fun. That but was later, the you know, winner of the Golden Cone Award. Yeah. That's what I was going to bring up. And who was one of them? Evan, you were yeah, one. Yeah. I want to, yeah, Jim, Jim, I, I wanted to add to what Jim said before about one of one of the things that may be overlooked um, that I'll bring to light is that Kenny and his 
teaching and not to cut short any of the other instructors that Jim or I have had over the years or any of the other builders who have coached us um, made us better at our jobs because not only can we talk the talk, but we could then walk the walk. We understood there's so many journalists and especially today in the, in the um, influencer age, you know, uh, you strike and I'm not knocking anybody, but some of these people I see have no experience. They've never raced a car. You know, they might have a following, but they, they, they haven't been, really been there and done that. And I'm not, hey, that's great. But we were able to start from scratch and learn what proper handling is so that when you sit down to write a story on whether it's Kenny's suspension or, you know, a Steeda suspension, a Celine suspension, any aftermarket springs or bars, not only did we really have an understanding of how the stuff worked and why it was supposed to work, but then when we tested the cars, we could detect the understeer, the oversteer, you know, how the car, was it, was it notchy or um, nervous on, on turn in? How did the car load up in the middle of a corner? Um, all these things that incorporate good handling. I think not that we're experts by any means, but we had a really strong understanding of what felt good and what didn't feel good. And that absolutely helped us do our jobs better. We, we learned how to evaluate cars in a realistic way. Yeah, we could talk about a car did this or that, but now we actually understood what was going on to a much greater degree. So when we wrote road tests and, you know, we, we had, when we were still in New Jersey, we had the road course at English town that had been built. We were the only ones able to use it. Uh, they didn't even go to the planning board before they built that road course. They did it because um, they wanted Richard Knapp to see a picture of it before he passed away. Um, so it took a couple of years before it actually opened, but we were using it as a test facility for years. And we actually knew what was going on with the cars. I mean, that was a great, great experience. And we could teach the readers what was going on. And we could say, oh, this car is the mock. We did one video of Mach 1 versus a Terminator Mustang versus a regular Mustang GT. And boy, you know, for the same chassis, those cars were all completely different. One of which the Terminator had an independent rear. Um, we could actually speak intelligently whereas i think years before we might have done that video and talked about how great these all three of these cars were but realistically we were now able to actually evaluate them in an intelligent or for me a semi-intelligent way so jim um i'm gonna get into a little something different uh we did a lot of uh truck events with Muscle Mustang and Fast Forward. And Jim and Kenny would put on a banquet every Saturday night. And um, first, Jim, I want you to explain some of the awards, such as the Golden Cone in the Toilet Paper Award. And then once you explain what the Golden Cone Award is, then I would like, uh, Evan, you to explain how you won that award. Well, how would you, you know, how do you describe the Golden Cone? I think it, it implies by its very name, um, you know, that you just, where you started out, you know, and where you finished. A um, couple of off-track excursions, maybe, or just being a little wacky. The Toilet Paper Award was when, uh, you know, you sent Kenny scurrying to change his skivvies after a session. Um, fortunately, I never got that one. Although I probably came close a couple of times, um, but that was we used to do so many schools and it was so much fun to give out those awards, the Golden Cone, and you know people just we taught people how to be drivers. Um, one guy who who could really give Spinny Vinny a run for his money with the Golden Cone Award was uh, Joe Dimo, the owner of Pro Five O Shifters, and the guy who literally invented the, the shifter that changed the Mustang hobby. Um, Joe was the sweetest guy in the world, but you talk about a guy who had, when he started out, man, he didn't have any business on a racetrack. I mean, he, he, he went off the first turn at Watkins Glen more times than probably Tony Stewart. I mean, he was, it was crazy, but Joe learned and he got to be a better driver and he certainly owned a, earned a golden cone award or two. I, I have a, real quick. I have a funny Joe Gimo story. So one of Kenny's things in teaching uh, race 
driving or road course driving was don't watch the guy in front of you. You still have to run your line. You have to be aware of the driver in front of you because he may or she may break earlier than you or later than you, and that can absolutely upset your rhythm. So I'm following Joe Drymo up through the S's at Watkins Glen at a breakneck speed because we were both driving capable cars, and we get to the bus stop, and all I see is a instant cloud of smoke, <laughs> and it, I, it freaked me out. And I still braked and turned in. And what it was was Joe just going way too hot, locking the brakes and sliding all the way to the exit of the uh, of the bus stop up there. And but the instant and the amount of smoke that those tires generated, I didn't know if he blew the engine. I didn't know what happened. But at that moment, I realized why you don't watch the car in front of you and you do your own thing out there. As hard as that may be sometimes, because you're supposed to look really far ahead. And if you can't see really far ahead because there's a car right in front of you, that's that's part of what, you know, Kenny started to get into with Jim and I, which was the next level, which wasn't just the handling and driving, but race craft, how to drive in a pack, how to drive around people, how to race a car. And it's a completely different skill set than being able to get in a car and turn hot laps around the track, um, being in traffic, setting somebody up for the pass, Blocking without, um, you know, causing an incident. If if you're actually in a heated battle, there's a lot to be learned, and and that's a whole different thing that Kenny was able to get into with Jim and I, which was pretty cool. And I, I still drive that way, much to my wife's dismay. In traffic, I'm always uh, in there battling it out, late breaking. You know, that's well, you are from Jersey. Yeah, well, you know, but um, no, I mean, again. I think back to, like I said, my time on the street now that I use everything I learned from Kenny Brown, literally every time I get in a car, you know, how to brake and how to steer and, you know, always be aware of everything around you. It's not, you know, you know, it's not a passive thing. You know, they, people talk about, you know, oh, driverless cars are in the future. I said, no, they're all, they're out there now, man. There's most of the cars on the road are pretty much driverless and it's not driverless, rudderless. So you know, like I said, I think half of the stuff that Kenny taught me has kept me alive to this day. Yeah. So, so Evan, I have a question for you. What did you do to deserve, deserve the Golden Cone Award? Yeah, you've been I'm kind gonna, of avoiding that, Evan. Yeah, you're I'm avoiding gonna, it. I'm going to be 100% honest. There is a photo of me with the cone on my head, which <laughs> yes. you guys have. Okay. I'm going to be dead honest with you. I don't know if there was like later on alcohol involved at the banquet. I honestly don't remember what the heck I did. But then again, <laughs> I don't remember a lot of stuff. So Do you remember, I, you remember what he did? You remind I, me because I would love to tell the story in my words, but I have no recollection of it. <laughs> you know, I don't remember either, to be honest. And, you know, we don't just give out the Golden Cone Award either. You have to really earn it. So I'm sure Evan did something that um, Kenny was, quote, unquote, impressed. Um, but uh, but I don't know. I, you know, Carrie, we're, we're going back some years now. You know? I know that um, quite a few years. I'll tell you what, I, re I remember watching Evan one time. We were at Putnam Park, and um, you could pretty much see most of the way around the racetrack except for uh, Dead Bear, which was the um, the carousel corner that um, Evan described earlier, which is a, a downhill um, off camber um, at the entrance and an uphill off camber at the exit. But I, I remember, um, I think it might've been an old blue watching Evan one time and, and he went into the, um, entrance of turn five. And I don't know if I just completely lost my vision or what, but I never saw him come out of turn five. And I was kind of wondering, did, was he that fast Did he, I just blink and I missed him or did he just disappear from the racetrack? Oh, he was um, scary fast. And he's scary fast. Um, so, but he did come back on the racetrack and I eventually I saw him, um, come back around. So I, I don't know what happened there. So I, I honestly know. think, I think I, I honestly, I would be a hundred percent honest because I love making fun of myself, but I don't think, I think I was just that fast and maybe, you know, you didn't have enough coffee. You couldn't follow me with your eyes or something, but you know, I think the only time I was terrifying, uh, terrifying in the carousel was that one time with Kenny and then go, I came in a little hot driving John Blevins uh, factory five, Cobra spec racer um, because John let me drive that car at that same event, but he, I think he let me drive it 
um, before I rode with him. I wish I would have ridden with him first because I would have had a better idea of how that car handles and you drive that car a lot different than you drive a Mustang. And I didn't really understand the concept of momentum. It was just drive it like a Mustang, but um, I had a moment in that car, nothing too bad, but uh, I didn't go off track, but it was a little sideways on entry. Evan, I, I've got a question for you. The, the first time, I, I'm sure that you remember Tom Reese fondly. Um, Tom was uh, the, the leader of um, track time right. driving, uh, driving schools. And, and I believe that there was a moment when Tom was in the car with you when you were coming through uh, the exit of Dead Bear at Putnam Park. And, and he did something um, with you that he never actually did with me. And I think he yelled at you. You remember that story? <laughs> he did. He did. Um, well, first, I got the best ride to this day. I've had the van ride at Bondurant. Awesome. Um, if anybody's ever heard the Bob Bondurant stories, then you know what I'm talking about. But before I answer your question, Tom Reese, not only do I remember Tom, but Tom gave me a ride around Putnam Park in a Ford Taurus. And it was the be best ride I've ever had in my entire life. And I've been very fortunate I've ridden with Dale Jr. at Las Vegas in a cup car. Uh, I've ridden with Rusty Wallace and Max Pappas at Road Atlanta. I've had some fantastic experiences to watch the pros do it. Tom in a Taurus was setting up in the grass, uh, taking apexes with half the car on the grass. It was the most fun ride ever. But, yeah, so coming through the carousel um, with Tom, and I don't remember which car we were in, but – I was like Kenny that first time. I was a little sideways on the exit before, and I was way on the throttle before, you know, really being in position and opening the wheel and getting the power on. I was like mid corner on throttle, sliding it through the corner. And uh, when we got done with that corner, he looked over at me and went, he went, excellent car control. Next time, unwind the effing wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's yeah, good. Tom, Tom was a character. He was um, he, he did some coaching with me one time. And I, I got to tell you that, in fact, um, Tom, he used to run the one lap of America. And eventually he got kicked out because he won um, like every he won the competition at every track. And I think he won the thing like four times in a row, four years in a row. And he was driving some kind of a car that had like an airplane window on it. I can't even remember. What the Constant, car was. Yeah. The console. Why I quit after my first time doing it? They had originally they had the 2.2 liter turbo uh, Dodge K car motor in them, um, and I remember he took me for a ride at my before I had ever even gone to a driving school. Um, I was a photographer at an, an event for Vet Magazine, and um, you know Tom took me for a ride in the Consulier and or Consulaire, whatever it's called, and I was like, it was an ugly car, but fast i mean it was like riding around the original ones like i said they had those it doesn't sound like a lot of engine but when you consider the whole car weight about two thousand pounds with the two of us in it it flew and it boy those things went around the track like you can't believe and later i think they put didn't they put a v8 in them later brad yeah yeah they did and he drove one with a v8 but you're right that was the most god-awful looking car i'd ever seen in my life I oh, mean, man. it, was just, it worked on track it can be yo Tell us your story at the Kenny Brown School at Watkins Glen about um, the dude with the spirit, the AMC spirit. <laughs> oh, that, that was Dean Doherty. Yeah. Dean, Dean Doherty was was Dean. my on-track mentor. He was the first driving coach that I ever had, and he was Mine a – too. <laughs> you remember he had that AMC spirit? Yeah, the, he built that car with a gigantic horsepower engine, uh, AMC powered, of course. It was – metallic brown poopy brown um but it was like him and his dad put that car together re-engineered the suspension it was like riding in a in a cup car i mean it was, it was a nascar stock car with an amc body pretty much yeah yeah i mean it was he was my first instructor at track time at charlotte motor speedway back when it had the original roval i did that in my 84 corvette and uh man what a what a great guy what a fun 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 car that was he took me for many rides in it and i was like you know you take a look at it and you're you're sitting there thinking well, i don't want to get in this thing i mean it was 
the poopiest brown of browns. And again, it's an, a basically a three door AMC Spirit, you know, hatchback. Um, it was not designed to be on a racetrack, but uh, Dean had yeah. other ideas. You got a question from somebody, Jim, in the in the comments. Yeah, uh, before you answer, before you answer that, Jim, um, anybody else have any questions for uh, Jim or Evan? Just please, please add them to the comments. And we're at eleven o'clock, so we're running a little bit over. Are Jim and Evan, are you willing to stick around a little bit? I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah, I already, I already, my private jet doesn't show up till two thirty, so I'm gonna go a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Well, Jim, um, I will read the question to you, and then you can answer the question. Uh, it says, Jim, I'm originally from Detroit, but I've been living in Point Pleasant Beach for the last nine years. Where in New Jersey are you? Honestly, I love driving my entire life, but the East Coast and New Jersey are some of my least favorite places to drive in the country. Well, you know, you're down at the Jersey Shore, which there aren't a lot of really great driving roads down there. It's completely flat. Um, I grew up in Jersey City, and the roads, you go a little bit west of the city out into the country, and there's these great, great mountain driving roads that are just, of course, the biggest problem you have is deer, hitting deer, and now bear. Um, I don't live in New Jersey anymore. I am down in Florida. Like, you know, it's kind of my job to move to Florida. If we've been in New Jersey a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, but the, the driving roads in West Jersey, uh, just unbelievable. I mean, just an absolute blast. Um, you know, when we did that video I was talking about earlier, you go out, take Route 23 all the way out of the state, and you're at Hawk's Nest, which is Jim, your um, something happened to your audio. You, uh, we can hear you, but it's very muffled. Um, I don't. I have. I didn't touch anything. Am I still muffled? Nope, yeah. not anymore. No, I was saying you've you've got to go to West Jersey and drive the roads up there because they're they're just really beautiful. Those mountain roads. You just really do have to be on the lookout for bear, and there's not a lot of runoff, so you don't want to be crazy. Um, but that's uh, that's the place to be if you want to drive in, in New Jersey. Jim, let me interject. The guy, the guy's name is Tim Allen, ironically, who asked the question. Tim, um, my dad lives down that way. Jim also lives in Florida down here with me now. We both moved down about 13 years ago. But So, Tim, from where you are in Point Pleasant, I'm going to give you an awesome road to drive. Take uh, Route 70 to 571 North, turn right and drive that road all the way until you hit Route 33. Um, it's probably a lot more residential um, than it was when I was there, but that road is probably one of, from where you are, it, it's very close to you, and it's one of the coolest roads, a lot of different types of corners, a lot of trees and people, so be careful. But uh, if you want to have like a little mini Tale of the Dragon kind of experience, you go drive that up and back, and you'll have yourself a blast. You know, it's it's amazing, Evan. You you and Campy have been together as long as I've known you guys, as long as long as I can remember. And it's it's absolutely incredible that you two worked together for all of those years. And I'm sure you went through some some great times and some some difficult times. But the the fact that you spent all of those years together and you are still as close as you two guys are. I mean, you got you guys are like brothers. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, a really a great thing to see that, that you guys have, have stuck together for, for all of these years. And I, I can only imagine that you guys probably got into a couple fights at some point, um, because you, you would have had to, um, you know, because now you're probably like an old married couple. Do you have, we've never had a screaming match. No. Even no, when I, think, I think Campy used to get mad at me because he would try to put like 17 stories a month on me and I'd whine like a girl, dude, it's too many stories. I can't get them done. Campy was as an editor and still to this day as a friend, the ultimate optimist. Like he, he literally sees the top of the mountain and beyond where I'm my nature. I'm more of a realist. So, you know, like, Hey, Evan, you going to a race this weekend. You're going to win, right? Like, well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm only racing NHRA, but, you know, I'll try, I'll try my best. And uh, there was always a great camaraderie between us. He's like my best friend in the world. 
Uh, I love the guy to death. Um, and he's mentored me as a, as a, you know, a writer, as a photographer. And it's kind of neat that I'm mentoring him a little bit on the YouTube thing now. So uh, I get to coach him a little bit. Yep. Which is kind of neat. So, but yeah, we're, we're, uh, I always have the utmost respect for him. I look at him kind of like my, like a big brother. You know, I got an awesome younger brother, but I don't have a big brother. And I kind of look at him like that. He's, uh, he's always the voice of reason. Um, I'm going to say that. Publicly. That's, that's scary that I'm the voice of reason. You're really, you're really not. I was just trying to throw that out there. <laughs> well, compared to you, I am the voice of reason. That's the, uh, you, you've you know. let me do some really dumb stuff like, 180 in the desert, almost fly off a mountain. Um, you know, every time I'd come back from one of these silly adventures and be like, Jim, you got to go next year. He never went. Yeah. It was like, I was like the kid who told his brother here, go do this, go light this on fire and put it out with your hand. You know, you know, I was the guy who's always, but you know, when Evan and I were on muscle Mustangs together and even after I was not editor, when Evan became editor, I was editorial director. And my philosophy on anything journalistically is, especially in the car magazine business, we had the key to the candy store. We had every opportunity present itself. The fact that my name is still on Code Blue, that we almost got to go road racing with that car, um, tells you, but we never took that for granted. And I think pro a lot of the problem with the magazines that you see today and after Evan and I got out of the business it's just, they're just collections of stories. They're not actual great reading material. You know, you when you have the entire automotive aftermarket at your fingertips and driving school with Kenny Brown and drag racing schools and you could do anything you want, man, you can't have a bad day. And I was always pushing Evan to do more because I recognized his talent. Um, and, you know, he pushed me and... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was it was those magazine days were some of the best of my life. But you know what? We still hang out. We still do stuff together, and the day the good times continue. Yeah, well, it sounds like your your um, and Evan's relationship is a lot like Carrie and I's relationship. She's the overly optimistic one, and I'm the realist in the oh, group. No, you're think, a pessimist. Yeah, you're no, pe no, you're a pessimist. I'm the resident pessimist <laughs> in the group. I, I I like to stick with reality, and this is what we can do, and this is what our bandwidth is and, and carrie's always been my big sister and she's always the one who's dri driving me to go farther go faster do more and i'm like i just want to go to sleep <laughs> actually but, you know i have one car carrie carrie and uh, brad that you guys haven't talked about that kenny absolutely adored which was kermy oh uh, yeah and it was when when things for he couldn't get a, i guess a dollar car or a mustang gt or what have you and he, he ended up with a V6, uh, New Edge style, green V6 Mustang with a five speed. And, you know, you go on track, right? Now, again, talk about red mist. You know, I've got enough testosterone for 10 guys. So does Evan. And here comes Kenny with this modified V6 Mustang. And, you know, if I didn't think Old Blue had enough power, I surely didn't think this did. But I managed to scare Kenny in that car at um, Road America. Brad, what's, what's the really fast corner at Road America that's also very dangerous? The kink. Every one of them? Yeah. Well, I remember, oh. I remember going through there like, you know, full bore. Now, again, I had a lot of experience with Kenny at this point. And it was sort of the same thing he said to him. He goes, he goes, that was fantastic. You did that absolutely right. Don't do it again. Um, <laughs> I guess plus, I guess I didn't realize how, you know, dangerous that corner was. And I did it right. And but I just figured, you know, well, it's because you taught me everything I know, Kenny. It's 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 your fault I went through so fast. But <laughs> that was, yeah, that, that was the kink. Yeah. That was, so every, everyone yeah. that crashes heavy crashes at the kink. Yeah. And I guess it, at the, that speed, it doesn't end well either. But um, but I remember going, that was a one-time deal. We only did one uh, Muscle Mustangs Kenny Brown Driving School at Road America. But what a what an amazing track and what a fun time we had. Um, you know, it's just, I'm really lucky that we got to do that. I mean, it was really, uh, 
you know, we it's amazing to think that how many schools we did at Watkins Glen. I think I spent more time at Watkins Glen than almost any other racetrack, except for the one at Englishtown. Um, and you really can't compare the two. The the track at Englishtown is really a drift course, and it's a good track to learn. But Watkins Glen is that's a man's course there. That you don't that track does not forgive fools. Yeah, and Campy, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, one of the we're going to have a public uh, celebration of life for Kenny, and we're going to be doing it at Watkins Glen. We don't have a date yet. I don't know if we'll be this year because they're full. Um, but he wants his ashes spread at Watkins Glen, so we'd like to extend an invitation to you and uh, Evan to join us there when that happens. So, oh, love to. So, that, that'll make for some great YouTube. Fodder and and you know speaking of YouTube, Campy, um, you're kind of getting into YouTube now, I guess under under Evan's tutelage since he he's mentoring you on the on the YouTube thing. But you know I I love what you're doing. Um, you know you you love vintage cars and um, and so you've got a, a YouTube channel. I think it's called uh, Muscle Car. Campy and and I love to follow it because you have some some great old Mopars and and Chevys and Fords and and everything and cars like when you and I were were growing up, um, you know those those were our inspirational cars. So why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about Muscle Car Campy and, and tell the viewers how they can find you and and follow you? Well, as you said, the name of the channel is Muscle Car Campy C A M P Y three words. Um, I'm on YouTube. I really do love vintage muscle cars in fact my first the first magazine i was the editor of was called muscle cars um it was the original muscle car magazine and you know those cars from the 60s and early 70s represent a time where you know they the horsepower was coming on but like gangbusters um but they they didn't really stop or handle very well um but they just had they the styling was unencumbered by government regulations. You know, you want to make them pointy, you want to make them wild looking. You know, I think of the, you know, Dodge Daytona and the Plymouth Superbird with enormous wings on the back. And, you know, I, the rumor was that the Superbird and Daytona couldn't be sold in Maryland because they didn't have front bumpers. They just had the nose cone because they were designed to win a NASCAR. I'm fascinated by those cars. I actually wrote the Encyclopedia of American Muscle Cars. I think it was, I don't want to tell you how many thousand words. It was 80 or 120,000 words. Um, so I really, in addition to my day job, I'm the uh, sales director for the National Muscle Car Association and the National Mustang Racers Association. So if you really were having an event this weekend in St. Louis, so if anybody is in that area we're at worldwide technology raceway this weekend but i do love like i said i love these old cars i you know wouldn't want to drive one on a daily basis anymore though i have done that too my my 65 dodge with a big block that's in my garage still was my daily driver for a while um until i realized that it still drank gas like it was 28 cents a gallon um but please check out muscle car campy on youtube uh please subscribe I need all the subscribers. <coughs> need all the subscribers I can get, and as I say, it's free and worth every penny. Yeah, and Evan, you've you've got your own um, YouTube channel, and it's it's quite interesting. Evan, you you have a long um, history and relationship with Ford, and um, I I love to, I like to live my life vicariously through you <laughs> now. Because you, you get to do some of the, the, the coolest things and, and, and a lot of what you're fortunate enough to do nowadays, um, you know, is an integral part of the, the content that you share on, uh, I think it's Revan Evan Media. Um, so why, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your YouTube channel and kind of what you've been up to, some of the cool um, Ford products that you've been able to drive um, this past year? Sure. Um, it, it, slight correction. It's just Revan Evan and Revan like an R Evan, not with an I. So it's just Revan Evan, a uh, little play on my name. Um, and I, again, I'm like, I'm very fortunate, Brad, that I have, I do have a lot of these connections. Um, I've been able to be a test driver for Ford on the last bunch of GT 500s and the GT 350 and the Cobra Jet Mustangs where I get to 
not only drive them before anybody else, but to be a part of uh, a very small part, albeit of the development team with helping with drag uh, launch control and things like that. And so I have a long standing relationship with Ford. The last weekend, Abe and I drove a new Bronco up in Michigan, uh, brand new Sasquatch that we uh, had for a week. That was pretty cool. Abe with, and I mentioned Abe, Abe Tang, who's uh, my kind of my partner in the YouTube channel and helps me uh, with the video shooting and, of course, tremendous amount of fabrication, that building that he does that helps with the tech side of the channel. Um, it, I look at my channel as bringing Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forward to life with a little bit of feature stuff. We would bring you in-car cameras on eight-second stick shift Mustangs and Thunderbolts, and we have access to people like Jack Roush, uh, I have a recent, fairly recent video where we were up at Roush. I think it's a shame that Kenny's not around because I can only imagine the the road course stuff we could have done with the two channels with with that. Um, but yeah, we just try to have fun. I just try to basically. Jim taught me a long time ago with the magazine that any story you do has to have reader value. You could get a new intake manifold, and yeah, like he mentioned, companies always threw parts at us because they wanted the ink. And a lot, a lot of times you saw, and, and I'm sure everybody's read stories where you're, you're left uh, dissatisfied. They talk about it, but they never went and did it. So with the channel, I try to take that where there's got to be some kind of value, um, a payoff where you spent your time watching me or Abe or somebody on camera, and you're either going to be entertained, you're going to learn something, or you're just going to laugh at us either way. Um, but we just try to have a fun time with cars. Sometimes I get away from the Ford stuff, not very often, but Brian Wolf has been an integral part of the channel, being able to do the 7.3 Godzilla stuff. Um, we've interviewed a ton of people. We've been to the racetracks. We're always open to new ideas. Um, like I said, it's just been, it's been like taking the content to the next level and it's exciting because you get to bring it to life. And uh, I'm actually thinking about, morphing it into some food reviews because when we're on the road, we always find these funky places to eat and we love food. So, and everybody likes to eat and drink. So why not talk about some of the great places that we find on the road when we're out there? Well, if I'm ever with you traveling, we're definitely going to have to find a taco joint or maybe five taco joints. And we're going to have to do some, some taco videos because I love tacos. Oh, uh, we could taco it up, baby. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Well, uh, I think we're probably going to wrap. We have a couple of questions and then we'll probably wrap it up. Um, but anyway, Paul Miller says, here's a tough one. What driving instructors or schools would you recommend nowadays? Obviously, the more input from several sources is always better to hone your own skills. But where would you start now if it were some, uh, something that you were just beginning? Can I, I'll answer that first. Sure. I think, I think the first thing you have to determine is whether you plan to be a race car driver and compete in a series and build a car, or you just want to um, drive fast on track safely and comfortably and understand the theory, because the, there are definitely driving track days. Like uh, I'm not sure if he still does it, but Jeff Lacina and John Blevins and Dell um, who have track guys and have fantastic instructors, and they're going to keep you safe and teach you how to drive a car. And that's at the most basic level. Um, from a racing standpoint, if that's your goal, I'm not 100% up on all the schools. I've been to the Utah Motorsports Campus and have gone through the a couple of the schools there, and they are teaching race driving. But you're probably going to want to have some basic talent because it's not cheap. So you're going to want to have a really good understanding of how to get around a racetrack or handling and um, braking and accelerating before you maybe go to one of those schools so that you can get more out of it. But if you have a street performance car, really there's chin driving days. If you just go online, there are a ton of, of places where you can get on track and you absolutely want to make sure that you have an instructor um, and make sure that you click with that instructor. If it's somebody you don't click with, speak up. Don't feel bad about saying, hey, we're just not clicking. I'm not understanding it or I'm a little uncomfortable. And then they'll get you a new instructor because that's that's a big thing right there. I've been very fortunate with Kenny and Jeff Lacina uh, to have some fantastic instruction and people who understood me and were able to take my personality and my understanding and build on that. Um, Bondurant as well. Jim, do you have anything to add? 
Well, Bondurant, I, that was the last school I did. I went to the Bondurant School in Phoenix. Um, at the time, they had uh, C6 Corvettes. Um, they then later changed to a Mopar school, so Challengers, Chargers. Um, but I think it's under different hands now. But the one thing I would say is just about every road course, big or small, has driving schools and driving clinics. If you can't, you know, if you can't afford to go to Skip Barber or some really high end school, take your car to a, a track. Like I said, I know English Town on their road course they do driving schools. Um, there's enough driving schools out there. Um, Jeff, you mentioned Jeff Lacina. He's at Hastings Motorsports Park now. They have a driving school coming up. Um, you got to do a little bit of research, but that's what the internet is for. Um, there are no, I would say there are probably no bad driving schools. Any, any school that teaches you car control, you get some time on track, it's invaluable. Like I said, you know. Jim, you know, as you speak of the internet, um, I know this might sound crazy, but I do a lot of iRacing. And if you have a decent setup for iRacing with some good equipment, it is absolutely invaluable for learning tracks and learning how to control a car because the, the algorithms and how they set the cars up is, is fantastic. You, Jim, you've driven my setup, and it's not a video game. It's not at all. No. It's really the, – the biggest problem I have driving your, your simulator is you can't hurt yourself, so I just do a lot of stupid stuff and end up – Red Mist. <laughs> hey, real quick, somebody, somebody just subscribed to our channels. Dylan, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Dylan. Dylan is Dylan is one of our um, Speed Therapy Academy students, so he's actually going through the program right now. And I always love it when he when he joins us for the um, for the academy sessions, which we do on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. So Dylan has a Fox body with a big giant turbo. Oh yeah. On it. So his back his background is always a picture of the engine bay of his car, and and so that always creates a lot of um, cool conversation when we have our master class instructors on. We we bring on instructors from their various different um, fields of, um, of performance and and racing, and we have we have lots of cool instructors. But but the first thing they always see is Dylan's engine bay, and and they always have to make a comment about it. But but Dylan's has a Fox body and he's, he's converting it into a road race car. And, um, this week his, his new independent rear suspension that we built for the car, um, was shipped off to him in, in North, North Dakota, but, but he is, he is a really great guy. And, and we're just so fortunate to have him as a, as a student in the Academy. And, and I'd like all of you that are viewing right now to take his lead, uh, sign up, um, uh, or subscribe to Revan Evan, uh, Muscle Car Campy, and also Kenny Brown Performance. Kenny Brown Performance, uh, we have a ton of videos on there. We have all 81 episodes of Cars and Coffee. And uh, what we've done is we've broken down uh, Kenny's tech talks during that time into like three to five minute segments. So you can go on there if you're looking for, you know, how to determine what brake pad you need. You can just type, uh, type that in and something will come up for you. Um, and he's he uh, goes over all the way from Fox Bodies all the way to the new S550. Um, so uh, definitely subscribe to that. And let's see, we have, we have a couple more questions uh, or comments. Mike Charles. Mike Charles, a, I think he has the Celine Race Car Facebook page. Um, and there is going to be a reunion at Watkins Glen September 7th and 11th. That's with the... Um, uh, they're going to be racing with... Um, Vintage car, yeah, vintage cars. Um, um, SBRA, yeah, and I SBRA. think, uh, yeah, so that's a SBRA and a Trans Am weekend. The Trans Am series is um, now its own series, and uh, uh, they recently purchased, I believe it was SBRA. If I'm not, some, somebody correct me if I'm no, wrong. Uh, no, the, the owner of SBRA also owns Trans okay. Am. Yeah, so, so that's a, those are great fun events to go to, but the Celine. Um, race car reunion is going to be at Watkins Glen September uh, 7th through the 11th and they have invited us to join although i don't know if we're going to be able to to make yeah, it up there for invited that kenny to join because they're, what they're having is uh mike has invited all the people that are related to the Celine pr program in the 86 87 probably 89 series uh steve Celine will be there a lot of the uh you know engineers the um 
crew chiefs, a whole bunch of people, and Kenny was invited to go there and talk about it. So if, if you're in the area, um, make sure you stop by. It should be a really good event. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more. Oh, Tony, I'll get you yours. I'm just going to read this comment out loud. Um, Sounds great, Evan. Was able to drive a new GT500 last summer in eastern Pennsylvania. What an amazing car that is. We love our new Bronco, and I actually went to school with Jack Ross Jr. back in the day. I guess I need to check out your channel, too. I miss the days of the magazine, but I would still like to get hear professional opinions on the new tech and experiences. And then Tony, we all know Tony. We refer to him as Tony the Tuner. It's been an honor to be part of the Kenny Brown family. Oh, thank you, Tony. Uh, like Evan, I have been blessed to do what I love and sharing the passion with everybody it has been an incredible ride. Kenny, Carrie, and Brad made me feel at home here. I will never forget it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And these kind of comments is what, if you listen to last week's episode, episode 80, um, Brad should be getting it up on the YouTube channel and it's on our Kenny Brown performance uh, Facebook page. It's worth uh, viewing that because you'll hear Kenny go through his career path. Um, we had uh, recorded this video almost a year ago, but he goes through his whole career path, which is pretty interesting. And then at the end, we have a little memorial for him. So it's it's really heartwarming if you need a, a little bit of that. I think I might go back and view it. Um, and then we have another one. I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't see people's names today. I don't know why it says Facebook user, but that's something I really uh, think I'd like to do. I love to drive and love to learn now if I can just get my car together a little better. Um, and then we have Summit Point in West Virginia has several groups, FATT, SCCA, and the H Hod Chin are. Yeah, it's Hooked on Driving, yeah. which is the Chin Motorsports Driving School. And, and they're pretty popular. If you um, just check, check your local track, um, there's usually always something going on there. Check their schedule. Um, you'll see Chen Motorsports um, Group and Hooked on Driving. Um, they they do track days at several um, tracks all across the country. And um, Evan, you mentioned Jeff Lacina, um, who was your co-driver in the One Lap of America when you when you guys won that. He is the uh, general manager now of Motorsports Park Hastings in Hastings, Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska. And um, that's a track that they've put a tremendous amount of time and effort into. They just repaved um, the surface. It's a great track to learn on. Um, he has a group of instructors and, and they do several open track days and, and driving schools there as well. In fact, in September, um, they're doing a big Mustang event there. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. And there's even some people who are coming in early on Thursday but the, but that has always been it's it's kind of still in its infancy. Um, they've done a couple of the the Mustang events there, but it's it's growing by leaps and bounds. There's always a a good group of people that have, that attend, and of course we've been invited to that this year as well. And so so next year we're talking about maybe um, doing a, a Kenny Brown Driving School um, in conjunction with their Mustang event there. So st stay tuned for that. But Always, always a place to go and get instruction. Just check with your local track, and they will point you in the right direction. Okay, and so if, if I may carry on. Sorry, I just want to say, don't forget about autocrossing. You know, you can you can learn a lot at your local autocross. There's events everywhere. They're not terribly expensive. Um, anybody, it's like going to a test and tune night at a drag strip. You can enter an autocross and really start to get a feel for your car. You know what you're doing. Um, some of them do have instruction, but there's a chance to get out and really exercise your car. And it could be any car. It could be your daily driver. It could be anything. Um, but don't forget about that. It's a, it's a great entry level way to get involved with handling and motorsports. And I guarantee you'll have a ball. Like I said, there's nothing about punting cones around on a, on an autocross course. A lot of fun. That's, that's so important, too. You're exactly right, uh, Jim. So I think in closing, I'm going to uh, announce a couple of things with Jim and Evan. Uh, in closing, if you just want to share a few thoughts about Kenny. Um, so right now, I just want to share with you, we are continuing on with Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown in spirit. Uh, we will be inviting guest experts uh, like Jim and Evan. Uh, we are also going to be showing some video of uh, some tech tips that Kenny always shared, uh, just some uh, encore presentations. So we'll kind of mix the two together in every Cars and Coffee. So we hope you will continue to join us for that. 
The company is continuing on. Uh, that's something Kenny wanted me to do is continue on his legacy. And uh, we have a really strong uh, team here and we will be doing that. One thing we're going to be doing is uh, building tribute cars. We have the first one already booked and another one I think that's coming in. And what that is is kind of the, uh, Kenny's iconic cars. We're going to be building something very similar to that to represent that. So the uh, uh, Fox Body Mustangs will be building an Outlaw Mustang for the SN95s. We'll be building uh, his Cobra CSRs and then the like a Red Rocket type car. Mm -hmm. And then um, for the... Um, We'll be building a, a, a kind of a tribute for to Kermie. And then we also, for the S550s, we and for the, what else was it? And also we have two of them actually right now for Ruby. I, I don't know if, I, if you've been following us long enough. Kenny names all his cars, but Ruby is the S. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Evan wrote, see, on the cover of Muscle Mustang Fast Forward, Evan yeah. wrote a brilliant article on that. Evan and, drove that car at Sebring, and I'm sure he had the time of his life. Yeah, and that's a Kenny Brown uh, CS. CSR car. So we're building a couple of those tribute cards. And then we also did S550s uh, and that would be similar to the Maryland car. So they're all really awesome cars. So that's something we're doing going forward. Uh, we also are introducing, um, We've already, he, he's already done it, but uh, introducing his K-Link, which is uh, like market disrupting. It is just incredible. It's a revolutionary product. live axle rear suspension for the S197 cars. And after you install it, uh, it's designed to work with our front suspension, but when, once you put the K-Link on your car, it basically handles like an IRS. So mm -hmm. in, in lieu of putting an IRS in an S197 platform car, um, Kenny developed uh, um, what he calls the K-Link. It's a patent pending. Um, it's a variation of the original Mumford link. It's a really cool design and, and man, does it really transform the car. So a lot of people said, hey, we want to put an IRS in the S197. And Kenny said, nope, you don't have to do that because you can use my new K-Link suspension and it will handle as good as any IRS that you can stick in there. So, so that's um, in production still. Um, we're making them in limited runs, which are already mostly pre-sold in most cases because we've got a list of people who are waiting um, to get them. But that's that's a suspension that we're going to be talking about a lot more in the, in the coming weeks and months. And so just a couple other notes. We are continuing our 15 free 15 minute consults. Obviously, Kenny will not be doing them, but uh, Brad will be doing some of it in Rich. So if you have any questions, just sign up for that. It's on our uh, website. And then uh, we will be continuing with the Speed Therapy Academy. So we will be doing uh, replaying some of what he had and we will be having live master classes. So uh, just continuing on as we were. Um, it shouldn't be a problem continuing, except for we miss Kenny dearly and his expertise. So um, Jim, why don't you share a couple of words if you want to in closing? Kenny? Well, yeah, I know. I know. Oh, well, I would say, first of all, Brad, you know, Kenny was a mentor and a dad to you in some ways, you've said. So I know the company you'll be helping carry. And, you know, I think Kenny lives on in all of us. Because of just That's for sure. What a wonderful guy he was. I mean, he taught us all so much, um, not just about cars. Um, his philosophies on things. Um, like I said, I, I so lucky that I got to know him as well as I did. I wish over the last, you know, my every life takes a different trajectory. Sometimes you never know. Um, the last time I saw you guys, I think was it at PRI a couple of years ago. And I just wish we could have spent more time together. Life is unfortunately like that. But I think like I said, just it's as simple as standing. We were standing in line to get lunch or something. You know, we just ran into each other. Um, those are the, the great little times. You know, yeah, we did our schools, we did our stories together, we we drove fast, but just getting to know Ken and spending time was something I won't forget. Yeah, it it. It's just incredible that that he's gone and he will it's such a loss to I think the Mustang industry and to obviously us as a business and us personally. Evan, do you want to say a couple of words? Sure. I, I mean I could just absolutely reiterate what can't be said. He just meant a lot to all of us. His friendship, you carry that with you every day. You carry the things that he taught, you know, that he taught me on and off the track. It's he's had a huge influence on me. 
as a, as a person more so than anything I've ever driven. Um, when you think about him, you just think all good things because he was a great man. And he brought a lot of people together with these events and with his passion. And I have so many great friends in the, in the industry and all over the country who enjoy racing Mustangs and road racing in general and just going and being a part of these events. And I've shared a lot of great times with a lot of great friends. Um, I travel a lot. I'm very fortunate. And no matter where I go, I know somebody. And that's a lot of that's because of Kenny and the events that we that we attended with him. And uh, I, I just I think about that stuff every day. And fortunately, with the iRacing, I get to employ uh, my road racing non-talent all the time. And I think about Kenny all the time when I'm behind the wheel. You know, and you think about all the people that he taught to drive. And I think of those muscle Mustang schools. And God, we did an awful lot of them. And there are a lot of those Mustang guys had never been on a road course before, even thought about learning. Usually the Mustang guys back, especially back in the day, their idea of turning was what you did at the end of the uh, drag strip, you know, and, um, and he taught a lot of people how to drive. And he, he really made you want to learn more about it. And, you know, that's, you know, like I said, his, his love of coffee, his love of, of single malt, um, you know, and his, his, just his love, you know, he was a very single minded guy. He was very, very, um, focused. I mean, hyper focused, um, which I'm not, you know, I'm like all over the place. I mean, I don't know if I have undiagnosed ADD, but Kenny was hyper focused. And, but I said, he loved to share his knowledge with people and his love of cars. And we're all very lucky to have known him. And, um, I think about him often. Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Evan. Those are those are great words, and and you guys sh should both know that um that really both of you shared a very special place in in Kenny's heart. He he knew he knew you for a lot of years. He absolutely loved you two kids. Um, he thought the world of you because you're like his kids in kind of a way, just like <laughs> me. So, but yeah, you you, sh you should know that 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 you two people really had a special place in in his heart. And uh, he truly did love you. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to hear that. Like I said, when we were able to present Old Blue back to him at Putnam Park, that was a very, very special, memorable moment in my life. And that was very special. I remember that. He was just, just so pleased. Um, I want to thank you guys for sharing this time with us. Uh, it was a pleasure. And it's always fun to hear uh, Kenny Brown's stories and how many people love him and what he what. He, an impact they've had on, on him. So thank you everybody in the audience for hanging out with us and um, we'll have you back again. All right. Looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. And so just remember we'll, we'll be continuing on with cars and coffee. We'll be doing it next week and Brad separate here. We're going to be talking about this. this. Yeah. So everybody check out this wheel. There's a story behind it. I don't know if you can see the damage on this it's thing. Missing a piece. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're gonna we're gonna tell we're gonna uh, tell the story uh, behind that um, next weekend, uh, next Saturday on Cars and Coffee. And um, another thing, so coming up on Cars and Coffee, I need to get with Doug Killian. Um, but we wanted to do a, a special Cars and Coffee episode, or at least half an half an episode with um, Doug Killian who owns a company called Autocraft in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he was the gentleman um, that worked side by side with Kenny on the short wheelbase T-Birds. So Jeff Jacobucci, if you're listening today, um, we're hoping to um, to feature your car as, as part of that. And, um, and so um, there's, there's some cool stories that, that Doug Killian has to tell about Kenny and those days when they cut T-Birds in half and shorten them up and even some cool stories about um, what Ford thought about it too. So anyway, we're going along here, but thank you for hanging out and uh, appreciate you, um, Jim and Evan, for joining us today and sharing your thought memories. Thank you. I'm honored to, to have been okay. asked to join. Okay. Well, we look forward to seeing everybody next Saturday for the next episode of Cars and Coffee with Kenny and Spirit. That'll be episode 82. And uh, apparently we're not going to do bagels and bull crap anymore. No, so not. I'm, I'm not. Well, you I really can't do bagels outside the New York metropolitan area. So 
You know, <laughs> you don't want to go with a second rate frozen bagel or something. That would be. Un <laughs> yeah. Cars and coffee will remain. Okay. Take care guys. Take All right. Bye-bye.